Welcome to the third episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course. Today we're going to be going over the device settings. Now as you can see, the options for both the DSP and diode device settings are slightly different. There are a lot of overlapping options here, so what we're going to do is go over each of them separately for their differences, and then we're going to cover everything that is shared between them, with the exception of the scanning offset adjust option, which we will be covering in the next episode. Starting off with the DSP specific settings. Now within the DSP settings, we're going to start with the enable U axis option. Now what the enable U axis option is for, is for it enabling additional axes. So that could be anything from uh, if you have rotary specifically set up to the U-axis, if you have a conveyor going into your work area of your laser, that's going to be a very specific use case, specific firmware installed on a Rowita controller or other controller, for example. There are various ways this can be used, but again, this is very specific. So if this isn't included in the documentation of your laser, in all likelihood, you're probably not going to utilize it. Going into the other options category here is the tab pulse width. Now essentially tabs serve as a way of holding pieces being cut out of a sheet of material together into the sheet. That way it can be easily transported, stored, shipped without losing those parts of a project or keeping those parts neatly together. For example, this could be used as part of like a 3D puzzle or a Model T-Rex cutout. And again, those tabs are utilized to hold the items into the sheet until you're ready to pop them out. And the purpose of it is to still be easily removed by hand. Now the value you're seeing here in millimeters is the width of the tab that holds those items in. Now we're going to go into this in more depth in a future project or another episode, but the idea is, is the larger the tab, the more firmly it's held in. And ideally you want the tab to be small enough to be easily popped out by hand, but strong enough to hold itself in without falling out under its own weight. This is a situation where it's going to change depending on the thickness of the material as well as the material being used. These settings for the tabs are also available in the cut settings editor and is a feature we'll likely visit in more depth later on. Now moving on beyond the tab pulse width, we have options for enabling a second laser. So enable laser two controls, enable laser two offset. These are for if you have a dual laser system. Now, for the purposes of this getting started episode, this is not something we're going to cover as this is a much more advanced topic, but just know that this isn't something you'll need unless you specifically have a second laser system within the same enclosure. Now, moving forward, we have increment file name on send. Now, the reason this is here is because the, one of the benefits of having a DSP controller is we can send our files from Lightburn over to the controller and run them right off the controller. Now what this allows us to do is, instead of hitting send and being prompted if the same file name already exists on the DSP controller's memory, it'll offset that name by adding a number. And if there's already a number, it will add an increment to that number. Now, depending on your workflow, this could be a benefit or it could be not a benefit. It really depends on how you're utilizing the memory of your DSP controller and the files on it. Disable start button. Now, this could be a benefit for some people. You may not want to accidentally start a job directly from Lightburn and send that real time to the DSP controller. You may want to force it so that the start option is disabled. The benefit to that is you can't accidentally start the job. What you would have to do is hit the send option and send it over to the DSP controller so that you're over at the controller when you want to start the job. Check bounds when framing. This has Lightburn checked when possible on frame that the frame moves are within the bounds. If you have a job ready to go on your work area here and you hit frame to see where it's going to frame out on your laser, this will allow the software to validate that everything is falling within the bounds of the laser. Now that's it for specific options of the DSP variety of machines. We're going to cover the G-code specific options now. And as you can see, again, it is similar in many ways but different in others we're going to start with the other options. Now within other options we do have tab pulse width just like we did on the DSP. However, it's going to serve the same function and work in the same way. Those tabs are utilized to hold the items into the sheet until you're ready to pop them out. We're going to go into this in more depth in a future project or another episode. Now moving on to auto home on startup. So unlike on DSP, the option to home the laser head is carried out via software through Lightburn, not by the controller of the laser. So if you did not enable it during setting up the device profile, as we did in episode one of the crash course, if your laser has homing switches, 
you can enable that feature here. If you do not, however, have homing switches, enabling this will cause your laser head to crash. This is called a head crash usually. The head basically hits into the side of the gantry rails or the gantry, and the belts in the drivetrain will follow up with an unpleasant noise of continuing to drive the head in the direction it can't move. If you find yourself in that situation and have accidentally turned this setting on without homing switches, this is where you can disable that option. Next up, we're going to cover fast white space scan. Now you'll notice there is a millimeters per minute value here. Because G-code based lasers are usually diode lasers and are often measured in their speed of millimeters per minute and are on average much slower, this feature can offer some relief in the form of time saving. Enabling this and setting a speed allows you to move faster across non-engraved areas as the head scans across, but only when the speed set here is faster than the existing setting being used for the layer settings you have set. If it is not faster, it will proceed with the standard speed for the layer across the skipped area because it's faster. You may find if you are too aggressive with this value and you're too fast, it can cause inaccuracy and wobble as the head speeds up and slows down in order to engrave again back to normal speed. So some fine tuning will be required and really to maximize this value, it's going to be very specific to your machine and the material and hardware used in its design. Following that up, we're moving on to enable DTR signal. Now the DTR signal option here stands for Data Terminal Ready, which is basically the way that some controllers in Lightburn enable communication by telling the other it is ready to go. This is usually not something you need to adjust, however, if during troubleshooting you find you are unable to communicate with your G-code controller, this may be something necessary to troubleshoot. Next up is Use G0 Moves for Overscan. This is for a limited scenario where you might be using a controller that doesn't use G1 Moves. If you find that you're burning during an overscan, troubleshooting may lead you to this option. Overscan is the space that is used to slow down the laser head after it's done engraving that line before changing direction and moving on to the next line. We now have enable laser fire button and laser on when framing. Diode lasers nearly never have a red dot like a CO2 might have. This feature allows you to, from the move window, set a low power percent and use low power beam to align projects using something like 0.5% or a fraction of a percent, which can be enough where you can see the beam but not mark the material you're working with. It is very important not to enable this on a CO2 laser. There will be zero benefit to doing so on a CO2 laser as it does not have a visible beam and may result in damaging you, your eyes, or your project. If you have a CO2 laser, you should instead look into setting up a red dot for alignment of your work or a beam combiner that has a red dot. Again, do not enable this option if you have a CO2 laser. Enable out of bounds warning. Now enabling the out of bounds warning is fantastic if you have homing switches because Lightburn will warn you if it believes you are going to run a job out of bounds, which is outside of your work area of your laser. This is very helpful if Lightburn knows where your head is so if you don't have a way of homing your laser, you may not get the full benefit. Next up, we have G-code clustering. G-code clustering allows Lightburn to work with your laser controller to cluster code that is either dithered or grayscaled to be more efficient and higher speed. It's not available on all controllers, though. We now have return to finish position. This allows you to tell your laser when you're done with the job where to move the head of the laser so that it can be out of the way at the end of the job so that you have access to your beautiful project. And last in the other options, we have Air Assist. Now within Air Assist, we have the M7 and M8 option. The M7 and M8 options are simply a command which is used by your controller when using Air Assist. The majority of G-code lasers with this feature will utilize the M8 option, not the M7. However, you do have the option here if you find that you need to change that. Now coming down to the last couple settings, we have the S-Value Max, Baud Rate, and Transfer Mode. The S value max is what is relayed as the spindle speed value by Lightburn to your controller. Or for our purposes, that equates to what equals 100% power. In some circumstances, you may change this. However, in my experience, I haven't had to change this on a controller yet. So unless you have a reason to change this, it's probably best to leave it alone. Baud rate. Baud rate is the speed in which the controller can communicate. Not all controllers can handle higher baud, or in other words, speeds measured in bits per second. By default, Lightburn will run this at 115,200. However, this capability may be different for some specific controllers. Lastly, we have transfer mode. 
buffered means it's sending the data ahead of when the controller needs it and allowing it to execute the data when it's ready to do so. Synchronous means that the software will send the data and wait for a confirmation before sending the next set of data. Buffered will generally be used more often and is usually more efficient. Now that concludes the unique settings between G-Code and DSP options for device settings. Now we're going to move into the shared options, the options that are the same between both DSP and G-Code. Origin. Now this is where your laser is going to be homing or where you're going to be starting the laser head. On a laser without homing switches, this is going to be indicated by the intended origin position. So where are you putting your head before turning on the laser and connecting to light burn? That is what initializes your 0, 0 or your 0 coordinate for X and Y. If you have a laser with homing switches, for example, like most CO2 lasers and some diode lasers, this is going to be where your homing switches are going to be engaged. So in the case of my CO2, my origin is on the back left. However, on the LaserStorm L5 Pro for me, the origin is on the front left. Now again, this is going to vary depending on model and if you've customized it or not. So just know that that's the basics of how origin works and if you're going to be using home on startup. You also have working size. So this is simply the field size of your work area, how big your gantry is, and functionally how much area fits inside of your gantry that you can control the laser in. Laser offset. Now when laser offset is enabled, it is used when you have a different style of red dot pointer that runs parallel or offset to where the beam hits for your laser. This allows you to offset the location so that your engrave lines up with where the red dot is indicating it's going to mark. Again, this is for if your red dot pointer is offset to where your beam is hitting. If your red dot is indicating that it's going to mark right where the beam is, then this isn't needed for you. That said, most users will either have a beam combiner or a red dot that is indicating off the edge of the head and pointing to where the beam is going to mark. So again, this may not be necessary for you, but is there if you need it. Next up, we have Z-Control options. Now within Z-Control, this enables the ability to offset the Z-Height during an engrave or before an engrave, or you can even set it to change per pass. These are unlocked within the Cuts and Settings editor if you double click on the layer in the future. We'll cover that again in a later episode. That said, this is useful if you're trying to cut something thicker than what your configuration might otherwise be able to handle. This is an advanced feature, so this is going to take time, planning, patience, and testing to get the hang of, and when used, requires attention in order to prevent running your laser head into objects that might cause damage. This is known as a head collision. Next up is the relative Z moves only option. This option makes it so that it is going to adjust based on the starting height, assuming you've already ensured your laser and material or where you want it to start and run, and make adjustments relative to that. With this disabled, it would use absolute height values. We now have optimized Z moves. Optimizing Z moves enables Lightburn to set or move the Z height only when required. This functionality means you can do more complex shapes or objects. You have to explicitly set each height for each layer and plan ahead to ensure that you don't have a head collision. This defaulted to off is set to retract after each cut, which affords different functionality depending on what you're seeking. Lastly, you have reverse Z direction. Now what that allows you to do is reverse the Z direction. This is helpful if the Z axis is moving in the opposite direction that you intend for it to move. Next up, down at the bottom, we have Enable Job Checklist. Enabling a job checklist is great if you want reminders that apply to every job, such as a safety item or something functional. Now one thing that I like to use this for is something like sorting cuts and layers order. For my purposes, this would be if, for example, I accidentally cut something before I engraved it. Normally you would engrave before you cut in order to help hold the material in place so that while you're engraving, the item isn't shifting around. Another great item might be turn on your chiller. Now the reason why I add this to my checklist is that running your CO2 tube without a chiller could be damaging. Because diode lasers don't use a chiller, this is more specific to my CO2. However, that said, this is very important because if, for example, you don't have a flow switch, this could be a very costly thing to forget. And lastly, I like to add turn on the exhaust. This is a pretty straightforward list and pretty self-explanatory, but it is things that a lot of people regularly forget. So having this pop up anytime you hit start or send could be a great way of catching yourself from making a mistake. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course. If you got value out of this episode, smash the like button, let everybody know the content's great. Subscribe if you haven't yet, 
And if you're interested in seeing future episodes of the Crash Course or other fun content, hit that bell icon so you get notified as soon as it goes live. If you want to join the LA community or just hang out and chat, there's links to the Discord and Facebook group down below. You'll also find a link to the Laser Master Academy, whose members I'd like to thank for making this all possible. We love learning and sharing with you all, and we couldn't be here in this capacity without such an amazing community. We hope to see you over on one of our communities, and I hope you enjoy the next episode of the Lightburn for Gantry Crash Course.